Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. I was going to take a break for the summer, but that was not to be. On May 13th, the very day that I made the announcement of my intent to take a holiday from video production, Anastasia Bendenbury of the Demystifying Science podcast sent me an email asking me to examine this manuscript placed in the physics archive. Soon links to the manuscript started appearing in the comments section of my videos and strangely some of those links quickly disappeared. Finally last week I decided to abandon my summer project temporarily and carefully read the manuscript. What a treat it was! In fact the reward was so great that I had to list a couple of highlights in this video. The manuscript outlines an independent reconstruction by three Japanese astrophysicists of the M87 data acquired through the Event Horizon Telescope or EHT. Everyone recalls the famous image how it made worldwide headlines and was the scientific talk of the planet for over a year. At the time you might remember that I produced these three videos stating that the publication of that image represented the death of astrophysics. Observational astronomy itself had moved beyond scientific rigor and into the production of dreams. No wonder I claim that cosmology is not science. Furthermore, anyone who has watched my videos on the CMB realizes the problems in cosmology. But what is unique in this manuscript is that several of the criticisms are exactly those that I mentioned three years ago. You recall that in this video I spent several minutes highlighting that the UV space covered by the EHT dataset for M87 was grossly under constraint. Here is a brief clip of what I stated. In these two figures you can see the UV space which is being sampled by the array during the measurement. The figure on the left displays sampling at the very center of UV space. This includes the ALMA telescopes and the ALMA apex pair in Chile and the JCMT SMA pair in Hawaii. In the figure on the right you see all the telescope pairs on greater baseline scales. There are a couple of things to notice in this figure. First, a key determinant of the final achievable horizontal resolution is determined by the baselines of the SMA PV and JCMT PV pairs. These have a baseline of 10,700 kilometers separating telescopes in Hawaii and Spain. They result in a theoretical diffraction limited resolution of about 25 micro arc seconds. At the center of this figure you once again find the very short baselines, namely ALMA apex pairs in Chile and the JCMT SMA pairs in Hawaii. Within each of these pairs the telescopes are very close to each other on the order of 160 meters for JCMT SMA. The pairs therefore occupy the center of UV space. In order to understand UV space just think about it this way. The center of the space sets the signal to noise on the final image while the sampling in the periphery sets the resolution. Note the circles on UV space which set the locations of points which should be sampled in order to achieve a resolution of either 50 or 25 micro arc seconds. UV space is exactly analogous to K-space in MRI. A double Fourier transform on this space could lead to an image, but of course this is not how it is done in this case because this UV space is grossly under constrained. Note that there are only two sampling areas on UV space which govern the claimed 25 micro arc second horizontal resolution. These are critical points and we will return to them soon. To help remedy the problem of undersampling, data which are complex conjugates of each other are being used to fill the UV space, as you can notice here. This is a common practice in imaging science. In all other cases the complex conjugates are not shown. Again, from an imaging standpoint, because the UV space is grossly undersampled, the inverse problem will be under constrained. For instance, if you cross the diagram from left to right at the center of UV space, you will encounter only five points. If you look a little higher, you would encounter only two points. One cannot do a Fourier transform on only two or five points. 
In MRI, case-based sampling usually involves 256 points for a single line, or slightly more than 128 points if half case space is sampled and you take advantage of complex conjugates. No one would consent to having such a grossly undersampled analogous case space form the basis of their MRI image and with good reason. The data would be essentially worthless. In any event, undersampling is a problem for the EHT consortium, which is addressed using maximum entropy methods since Fourier transforms cannot be performed. Maximum entropy methods are powerful approaches that is certain, especially when sparse data sampling is present. That could form the basis of an entire video, but for now, just remember that the UV space is not adequately sampled to constrain the final image. Now read what the Japanese team had to say. The UV coverage of the EHT lack approximately 40 microsecond fringe spacing. Combining with a very narrow field of view, it created the approximately 40 micro arc second ring structure. Later in the paper, they write, the essential reason why the ring image was obtained by all the EHTC imaging teams is the limited UV coverage of the EHT array for M87, namely the data sampling bias. In addition, the very narrow field of view setting of the EHTC strongly helped to create the approximately 40 micro arc second ring shape from the EHT UV data sampling bias. They make the point again. This means that the UV coverage of the EHT array from M87 can create the 40 micro arc second ring regardless of the real structure of the observed object. In other words, the EHTC result is indistinguishable from artifact. This bears repeating. The HTC result is indistinguishable from artifact. They discuss the lack of proper UV sampling in detail, but again, I made the point three years ago. Now everyone can understand why I took such a strong stance. The ring structure is simply not there, and the Japanese authors make the point emphatically. In the central core region, we could not find the ring structure reported by the EHTC, but found a core knot structure. And again, unlike the EHT collaboration result, we could not detect any ring structure, but that the emissions at 230 GHz come not only from the narrow central region less than 128 microarc seconds in diameter, the EHTC field of view, but also from the jet region. So they find a core, a knot, and a jet. But the fact that a jet exists in M87 has been known since 1918, as can be seen in this paper. So nothing new was in fact discovered. Moreover, the EHT collaboration failed to detect the jet, a sure sign that their published ring result was unreasonable. You recall that I also commented on the signal to noise in the EHT data. Here are a few excerpts of what I said. But there is another problem still, and one that should give everyone cause for serious concern. Let us have a look once again at the points that set the horizontal resolution namely those involved in the JCMTPV and SMAPV pairs on the lower right of this figure. There are only four data points now for each pair. Here we find a stunning observation. The lowest signal-to-noise point on the SMAPV dataset has a value of only about one. That implies no signal at all. The other points have a signal-to-noise of about two or three. Again, that is almost no signal-to-noise at all. We are finding the same fluctuations in signal-to-noise as was found in the ALMA apex pair, but now the consequences are much more serious. The PV baselines are important in setting the resolution. However, they have extremely low or non-existing signal-to-noise. In fact, the signal-to-noise is so low that I want to highlight one sentence from the EHT papers. For many of these EHT baselines, the astronomical signal is not detectable above the noise until phase corrections resulting from these calibration solutions are applied, and the data is coherently vector averaged. Now here's what the Japanese have to say on the matter. We set the signal-to-noise ratio cutoff equal to 3 for safety. This signal-to-noise ratio cutoff is larger than what many researchers use in the end. Solutions that did not meet the criteria signal-to-noise ratio cutoff were flagged and abandoned. The point here is that the Japanese were being careful, whereas the EHT collaboration was calling noise signal. 
a signal to noise of one is no signal at all, yet they had used such so-called data in their processing. That was a sure sign of pathological science. Next, you might recall that the first reported image of a black hole contained 184 megabytes of data extracted from a 5 petabyte data set. You can download the full resolution image using the ESO link provided below. In this video, I had objected to the claim that a valid image made up of a few hundred megabytes of data can be extracted from a 5 petabyte data set. The problem is that the complete data set contains powerful signal from numerous radio sources in the sky, and those signals must be perfectly removed in order to get the small residual image that astrophysics seeks. But the desired image has a relatively poor signal-to-noise by comparison with other powerful signals also providing signal. In any event, such extraction requires perfect data processing and knowledge which can never be achieved. Extracting weak signals in the presence of powerful signals is always a challenge in imaging, and that challenge will grow significantly as the data set expands. Large data sets present new sets of problems unfamiliar to anyone in imaging because there is no means to validate any of the resulting images. In reality, the processing of such large data sets will lead to unknown and unrecognized errors. This results in the presence of artifacts which cannot be resolved from actual signal. My objection in this regard stands. In fact, if one examines figure 8 in the Japanese paper, the presence of an artifact is clearly marked because the authors recognize that this feature cannot be real. By the same reasoning, they cannot ensure that other features in their images are real. Who is to claim what section of an image is artifact and what section is real without proper system quality assurance as I discussed in this video? So even the reconstructed findings in the end will always be questionable. In the reconstruction paper, they highlight one important point which I had missed, namely that the EHT collaboration noticed sudden large amplitude errors at one of their detection stations when examining calibration solutions. This is what they write about the problem. These large amplitude solutions may have implied that the resulting image is significantly wrong. And later they write, Therefore, if such large amplitude found in self-calibration solutions are negative signs against the resultant image quality, the results obtained by both the EHTC and our work should be rejected. The authors are to be commended on their honesty. I simply caution them on the title of their manuscript and the continued insistence that a black hole has been imaged, as there is no evidence whatsoever of a supermassive black hole in M87. The hypothesis they present that a feature in their image might represent a secondary supermassive black hole orbiting around a primary black hole in M87 must be considered as outside the bounds of reason. Who is to testify that this feature is not an artifact and that even a primary supermassive black hole feature exists? This can all be processing artifacts. In any event, it is time for physicists to remind the astronomers that binary stars rotate about their barycenter and there are no black holes about which these binaries rotate. It is likely that this is also true in galaxies, although other unknown factors may be at play. We surely do not understand the mechanisms for jet formation. One does not need supermassive black holes except when faulty calculations lead to the conclusion. As I mentioned in my first video against M87 image claims, the stars are condensed matter, and for that reason alone, black holes cannot exist. It is as simple as that. But for those who still care about thermodynamics, the Hawking temperature associated with a black hole is not intensive, and that is a sure sign that the concept is physically invalid, as it is a violation of the zeroth law. Moreover, Hawking radiation, which is claimed to have a black body form, cannot exist because the production of a black body spectrum requires a vibrational lattice and none was ever present in a black hole. I had discussed these ideas in these videos and papers. If you need even more proof, have a look at the work of Stephen Crothers highlighting the errors in black hole mathematics. Stephen has been invited several times to present his ideas at physics conferences in Russia, and a link to one such conference is provided below. In addition, Dr. Zhang 
A 1989 graduate in physics from the University of Texas at Austin essentially asked this question on ResearchGate. Find an error in Steve's paper and stop the personal insults. At present, there are only a few people trying to pull astrophysics back into reality. Let us hope that their numbers begin to grow. So thank you, Anastasia, for bringing me the link and for all others who posted the link in the comment section. It pays to have friends and I have found that I have more than a few amongst my supporters. In this regard, do try to support Michael and Anastasia in their Demystifying Science podcast, which is linked below. They are a young couple devoting their lives to science promotion and they are not afraid to address established dogma. In the end, you may also wish to download the manuscript for yourselves and enjoy the read. One has to wonder when the EHT collaboration will admit their scientific errors. But one thing is certain when they do, it will not make worldwide headlines, but rather will be lost in a footnote. They are now reporting a ring image from Sagittarius A star, but that image will also turn out to be irrelevant. Moreover, no one will be able to turn that ring image into a jet because Sagittarius A star does not possess jet emissions. Suffice it to say that astrophysics has taken the entire planet for a wild ride into black hole nonsense. It is time for rationality in this discipline. Their peer review is obviously non-existent, for otherwise someone would have caught the error in undersampling UV space. There are real problems in the world. How much longer must taxpayers keep supporting the folly which astrophysics has become? Well, that is all for now. As always, keep spreading the word. And if you wish, support me with a like and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars, and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below. And I'll see you soon on our next video.